All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. It is Tuesday, and you know what that means. Today, we are continuing our series and classic teachings on spiritual truth and enlightenment and diving deeper into the section entitled Lifting the Consciousness Level of Mankind. And how about that, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me. This has been a fascinating series and is always fun for us to find some classical teachings on spiritual truth and enlightenment coming to us once again from the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins. And this is in the section entitled Spiritual Consciousness. And so we went through such ideas and topics in the last few weeks as becoming a spiritual seeker. And then how that can lead to surrendering the small self. And what that entitles and is all about entails maybe and so then we become the witness becoming the witness and being able to become the noticer and understanding that there is an i and a self and so the sound then of god is silence is what we went through and that also um, came up in our hermetic series as well learning about coming to this being able to still the mind and entertain silence as being a gateway to more deeper spiritual insight. However, then we got to the section that we are in now, lifting the consciousness level of mankind. The more aligned you are with spiritual reality, integrity, and truth, and the universal love, the more profoundly that we are affecting the world without actually having to do anything at all except for just that. Ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not, we are influenced and, affect, and affecting the world and ourselves and those around us in whatever way we choose to be. So if we choose to be negative and pessimistic, then we are having that sort of influence and so forth with the opposite of positivity and optimism, ladies and gentlemen. So we have the choice. Let us dive in now today and finish the second half of this section entitled Lifting the Consciousness Level of Mankind. And so, we'll begin here where it says, people who say, this is David Hawkins speaking now, quote, people who say they don't believe in karma can do so as a belief system, but they would still have to explain how it is that all phenomena have, have, have ever occurred throughout all of history are recorded forever. Referencing possibly the Akashic record, it continues, quote, how do you explain that every entity that gets born on this planet already has a calibrated level of consciousness? Therefore, we did not arise out of nothingness, but out of somethingness. And what is that somethingness out of which we all arise into which we all return? He asks. That takes us out of the limitation of the time frame of the present. And we begin to see and experience life in a greater dimension. And the spiritual realities that arise out of contemplating such things encourage our investigation into spiritual truth, which is the purpose of this kind of work which is the reason that we are here, ladies and gentlemen, remember, seeking to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through a greater awareness and understanding of the nature of reality in ourselves. And so through that awareness, we can hopefully use that to increase the quality of our lives and the lives of those around us and have a positive impact on all of reality and humanity by lifting the consciousness level of mankind. Now, <clears throat> With that said, Dr. David Hawkins continues, I wanted to first present the whole panorama of consciousness, its evolution, its quality, its nature, and how it's been approached through science, reason, logic, philosophy, ethics, theology, and religion. How it has evolved in mankind and how it manifests itself and the part that it plays in our everyday lives. Force, then, requires energy, and it exhausts people. 
People can only exert force to a certain point, and then they begin to collapse. Power, on the other hand, see, this is going back to the sentiment that he was getting at in last week's reading, where he said, we understand then that basically the human consciousness is innocent and it doesn't know truth from falsehood. That's what last week's topic was about. The reason he had to write the book, Power Versus Force, is because it staggered him. And he realized that man has never had the chance to know truth from falsehood. This ability that was created or achieved by the calibrated map of consciousness or, or applied kinesiology, being able to do these forms of muscle testing and kinesiological tests to determine things that give a weak and a strong response, the strong being the truth and the weak being the lack of truth. And he distinctualized that before as well. Hope you got yourself a beverage, ladies and gentlemen. Cold or hot, depending on your choice. And I hope it's beautiful wherever you are, regardless of the weather. And so, this is fascinating. Let us continue. Logic, philosophy, ethics, theology, religion how it has evolved in mankind and how it manifests itself and the part that it plays in our everyday lives. Force requires energy and power, on the other hand, does not exhaust itself or the user. In fact, the more it is used, the more powerful it seems to be. So think of it this way. Force, run out of force, power, becomes empowered. For instance, because it does not exhaust itself. In fact, the more it is used, the more powerful it seems to be. For instance, if we experiment with forgiving people and being willing to love and love unconditionally, see, there's these are not forcing things. These are power. We find that that capacity grows. The more you are forgiving, you have more power to be forgiving. And you are not exhausted. You are empowered. Same thing with generosity and giving. You have this sort of empowerment, and it feels good. And it is not exhausting like the opposite activity would be, which is up to you to think of what that opposite activity might just be. Leave me a comment. What do you think would be the opposite of Forgiving or being generous and giving. Well, and being willing to love and love unconditionally. In the beginning, Dr. David Hawkins continues, it may seem difficult to love that which seems unlovable. But if we dedicate ourselves to that way of being in the world, say to this kind of lifestyle or this kind of perspective that we have, that we create within ourselves to go to be able to go about life with a loving appreciation and reverence and seeing that all of creation is God or the universe or reality, whatever it is that we are a part of, and then being able to appreciate that and see the beauty in it. And so we dedicate ourselves to that way of being in the world. We dedicate ourselves to being that way in the world. And then we can find that it's easier and easier and easier and easier. And it stacks on itself and it is not exhausting. We find that with force, the more you give away, the less you have. But with power, the more you give, the more you have. And see, this is one of those things about manifesting. When you get, when you are attached to the results, so you are expecting an outcome. This is not aligned with the harmony of the universe or God, or this is not aligned with power. So when you give something, expecting the universe to give you something back, or even the person that you gave the something to, and you're expecting to get something back, like if you give time and intention on focusing something you want to manifest, and you are so attached to the result, and you become upset with the 
you know, the non-appearance of the result in the exact way and amount of time that you expected the money or the job or the house or whatever it is to appear for you in your life, you are blocking the flow of that from the universe into your life because you are not, you are forcing, you are trying to control and you are not allowing and being in harmony and detached from the outcome. Sorry, I thought it necessary to go on that rant. So remember to be detached from the outcome and to be fine with the way that things seem to present themselves. And when you can be in this kind of allowing detached har harmonic frequency, uh, field, consciousness, level, power versus force, then you may find that the things start showing up in your life in ways that you never thought that you'd expect them to. And in different forms as well, like maybe rather than a pile of money, you have a new opportunity that gives you financial security and comfort in that aspect. See, it's usually the feelings that we're going after here. All right, let me continue, ladies and gentlemen. So we find... That with force, the more you give away, the less you have. But with that power, with the harmony, with the allowing, the detachment from the outcome, the more you give away, the more you have. So the more loving a person is, the more loving their world becomes. When you have, this is what change your thoughts, change your life was all about. Living the wisdom of the Tao Te Ching by Dr. Wayne W. Dyer. We did that series on this channel previously so if you missed that series the Tao and the wisdom of the Tao, it was immensely powerful profound and life-changing and it, it describes exactly what we're talking about here this ability to change the way you look at things and then the things you look at change and so when you are able to become you know to have this capacity to be willing to love and to love unconditionally regardless of you know, some of the previous uh, judgments of duality that we may have had of this is this is the way that I think it should be and other things shouldn't be this way. And, and we can begin to allow and say, well, it's out of our hands, but we do the best we can. And so it may seem difficult in the beginning to love that which seems unlovable. But if we dedicate ourselves to this way of being in the world and changing our perspective, and having a new experience of life, then we will find that the more loving we are, the more loving our world becomes, and the more that we can be in harmony and allowing and unattached, then the more that we give away, the more that starts to show up into our lives and amounts more than we could have expected before, ladies and gentlemen. And there's a great quote by Henry David Thoreau that I haven't thought of in a long time, and it was my favorite quote for the longest time. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I think this will fit just appropriately. Let's share the screen real quick here. Henry David Thoreau, right here. If one advances confidently in the direction of his or her dreams, of their dreams and endeavors to live the life which he or she has imagined, they will be met with a success unexpected in common hours and then i didn't know about this larger second half here let's check it out they will put some things behind they'll pass an invisible boundary new universal and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around within them or the old laws will be expanded and interpreted in their favor and in a more liberal sense, and he will live with the license of a higher order of beings, ladies and gentlemen. But the most important, most important point to me there was this bit. If one advances confidently in the direction of their dreams and endeavors to live the life which they have imagined, they will be met with a success unexpected in common hours. So that point that we are getting at there that when you can be in alignment and detached from the outcome and, you know, like 
the old story says, go about your business in the way that you know that you need to and want to, then it will follow you wherever you go. This, When you have this harmony and this power rather than force, then the amount that you give away will never exhaust itself. And in fact, it will begin coming into your life and amounts more than you ever expected before will be met with a success, unexpected and common hours. Now let us continue and get back to the words of Dr. David R. Hawkins. So the more loving a person is, the more loving their world becomes. We begin, he continues, quote, to experience the world of our own creation. He's describing manifesting here. I did not know we would go this way today, ladies and gentlemen. However, some people say, he says, when you go to New York City, and they're all so cold and horrible there, I hate New York City, they're all mean. Another person says, and goes to New York City and says, my goodness, they were the most wonderful people, all the waitresses and cab drivers, and they were so neat. It's just an incredible place. Well, it's because in the presence of love, we precipitate the emergence of love in other people. And when we are not loving, we tend to bring forth the negative side of their natures. And this is so true. It's like wherever you go, there you are. So if you can't appreciate where you are now, you're not going to really be able to appreciate anywhere else you go. Because you are not in a state, in a state of appreciation. I mean, that's not to say that there isn't some places that are much more easily enjoyable and more comforting and so on and so forth than other places. However, as you can see, we find that with force, the more you give away, the less you have. But with power, the more you give, the more you have. So align yourselves with love, ladies and gentlemen, and begin to be that who precipitates the emergence of love in other people. Begin to have the perspective and the new perspective of life in that way. Remember, what you look for, you will find. You'll find what you look for in life. So... Be very careful. So we're all experiencing, then, is the kind of world that we are perceiving or expecting and precipitating. A virtual display, pretty much, of what we and ourselves are, of what you are, and the, you know, the thoughts that you have. Like the, the secret of the universe, what you think about expands. Your thoughts are the most important thing for your life. So if you want better things, try to have better thoughts. And this takes practice. This is why the sages and the mystics and the philosophers and, you know, all of the greatest minds throughout all of times, the sages of the ages, ladies and gentlemen, have told us, that contemplation and meditation and clearing of the mind and working with your mind is the most important thing that we could possibly ever do for ourselves because of this knowledge, because of this understanding that what we think about expands and becomes our lives and on a collective level becomes the reality that we collectively experience. And that's what this chapter has been about on how you can be sitting in a cave, not interacting with anybody. But however, what you are, who you are, will have an influence on all of humanity. What can I do to help the world? Some people will ask Dr. David Hawkins. It's like the best thing you can do is become the fulfillment of your own potential because each inch that the sea metaphorically rises, it lifts all boats. 
Nobody has enough strength in and of themselves to lift a boat, metaphorically once again, but if we can come together, we can lift everyone on it. And so the more we are aligned with spiritual reality, integrity, truth, and the universal love, the more profoundly we are affecting the world without having to do anything. Of course, doing good things works, however. So that doesn't mean do nothing at all. Let us continue. We are all experiencing then this, this kind of virtual mirror display of our perception of reality. So begin to change your thoughts in order to change your life. Dr. David Hawkins continues and says, The contrast between power and force is given dramatically by historical example of the British Empire. Vis-a-vis -vis Mahatma Gandhi. Well, Mahatma Gandhi, as you know, was a Hindu ascetic. And if you calibrate Gandhi, he's over 700 on the map of consciousness, which we looked at last week. At the time that he contributed, sorry, confronted the British Empire, it was the greatest force the world had ever seen. It ruled one quarter of the world, one third of the planet and the seas. And when I was growing up, you know, that really makes me think about this new book I got here, Evidence, ladies and gentlemen, of the old world. John Levy, David Edward, discover the secret reality and the evidence they're trying to hide from you. Over 300 academic references and over 250 images Evidence of the Old World, ladies and gentlemen, offers a groundbreaking re-examination of historical architecture, urban landscapes, and challenging conventional wisdom through a new awareness and a new perspective of possibly our history. That's a fun subject, and we'll save that for the future to dive into that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure many of you have been awakening to those possibilities in the last year, it seems to be very common for many of us that are open minds and are studying and researching. However, back to the British Empire that ruled one quarter of the world and a third of the planet and the seas. Hmm. When I was growing up, Dr. David Hawkins continues, it was still the great British Empire upon by which the sun never set. Against that stood a little 90-pound Hindu, skin and bones. He confronted the great lion who ruled one-third of the planet. The interesting thing is that Mahatma Gandhi, by doing nothing, remember the Tao does nothing but leaves nothing undone. By doing nothing, in fact, just saying he's going to stop eating. And if they didn't like it, he'd just starve to death threw the world into a panic. Now, this is a fascinating research experiment. How this is possible? How can... So at 700, Gandhi stood there. The level of consciousness, 700. And so, of course, 700 is of enormous power, extremely rare on the planet. He faced off against the British Empire, which in its pridefulness and self-interest calibrated at 190. Without firing one single shot, Gandhi defeated the entire British Empire and took it apart and brought the end of colonialism. That's crazy. I haven't done a ton of research into that story, and I'm sure there's different opinions and theories, Thoreau's about it. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, but he continues, it was not only the British Empire, but colonialism per se, that he defeated and self-rule became the dominant political system in the world. What Gandhi really represents then is the influence of power rather than force. Power doesn't cause things. Force can be said to cause things. With the Newtonian paradigm, power, on the other hand, influences things. It does not force or cause things. 
It allows and influences things. See, think of this when manifesting. You're not trying to force a creation into your life. You are trying to influence reality with your intention. This is profound, ladies and gentlemen. So force does not, power doesn't cause things. Force causes things. Power influences things. Now you know that a quark is going to rise depending on the destiny of the medium that it finds itself in. So by prayer, by spiritual evolution, what happens then is that mankind creates a very powerful field. This field is this spiritual reality, which then begins to lift and affect all of mankind. It affects the whole paradigm of what reality and our values actually are. And this is obvious in the evolution of the consciousness of mankind throughout the, you know, the yuga cycles, and at least the ages of our current cycle that we're in. And we can see already how our consciousness level has risen since the Dwarpa Yuga, was it? Dwarpa, Kali, Treta, Satya Yuga. And then to the descending versions of each of those in ascending. We are in the ascending. So we are rising, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully soon into the Kali Yuga, or hopefully we're there already. However, that's a different subject. We referenced that as well last week and multiple times on this channel. So if you've never heard of or searched the Yuga cycles, check that out. It is fascinating. We live all. We all live by our own principles. And so it's like th it affects the whole paradigm of realities and values. And we begin to experience a new reality. And so he says, as I mentioned before, integrity is now becoming a predominant value in our society. It's being talked about constantly in the media now this book may be a few years old so things evolve and change over a short period of time nowadays however we have a whole new value system now that was not brought about by the mechanism of force he says nobody forced the media to begin valuing integrity but integrity emerged as a social value as an, a consequence or an effect of the increasing level of our collective consciousness. Now, not as a spiritual value yet, but as a social value. So we're not, you know, don't give us too much credit, ladies and gentlemen. We're not there yet, but I would like to think things are getting better, faster than possibly the most optimistic of us could believe and could hope. Not as a spiritual value, but as a social value. We all live by our own principles. Spiritual growth then means what principles do we live by? And as we grow and mature, we choose different principles. So as we learn and understand and advance, we begin to understand that, oh, maybe that wasn't the correct way, and we should then have a new way. So as we grow and mature, we choose different principles. Some people live by the principle of always be right and never give the sucker a break. People come out and state what their principles are. Sometimes they seem quite outlandish. But you could say that they are integrous to the degree that they live by them. To the degree that they live by them, they are living by what they are committed to. In other words, you know, this thinks of this makes me think of when we're judging people, and we are forgetting that they only are able to do the best that they are able to do. You know, they can only um, like they are on the path they are on, and each one of us is on a different path and a different level, and 
we are only able to do what it is that we are able to do that we know and that we have under you know so it's very a lot of times we end up judging other people thinking that they should be in a different position in life but you know like not on the path they're on and it's like they only know how to do what it is they know how to do and so how can we expect them anyways let's get back to what dr david hawkins is saying it's like he res so i respect what people say they're committed to and i think to the degree that they live by that and they're being virtuous by their own definition remember this goes back to the subjective viewpoint i mean it's different for each one of us so so the calibrated level of consciousness he continues to some degree then reflects the degree to which we live by our own standard or stated spiritual choice our own uh you know principles so to speak i mean that was a very deep sentiment there that we all have our own sort of principles is you know when we we tell them to each other sometimes it seems very outlandish because we all have so different ones but you could say that we're all being integrous to the degree that we are living by our own principles even though they may be different from one another and so he says i respect that at least people are committed to what they are committed to and i think to the degree that they live by that they are being virtuous by their own definition to their own principles so the calibrated level of consciousness of each individual whether we are very highly spiritual or not depends on those principles for us personally and it, it reflects the degree to which we live by our own stated spiritual choice he continues, you might say karma or spiritual destiny. The calibrated level of consciousness then is the consequence of spiritual freedom of choice. See, we have the freedom to choose, ladies and gentlemen, of what our principles are and where we want to be and how we want to experience our reality related to resonance and resonating with harmony of god or the universe or the Tao, atum grand organized design god great spirit whatever you want to call it you might say that karma or spiritual destiny the calibrated level of consciousness then is the consequence of this spiritual freedom of choice so we have freedom of choice at every moment but this freedom of choice seems to be obscure to us we seem to be run by subconscious programs. It didn't say subconscious there, but I added the word. We seem to be run by programs. And one reason that we try to transcend the ego is because we don't, we no longer want to be just running these programs. It's because we don't want to be at the effect of the ego, but we would like the mind to stop long enough for us to deliberate and to make a choice. And so often, we do a thing quickly and then we regret it later and sort of get a feeling of like resentment thinking gee i didn't really have the choice in that situation the way he puts it is more even uh relatable to all of us is gee i didn't really have a moment to even think about that and make an appropriate choice which is where this kind of study and becoming aware of your thoughts and yourself, beginning to know thyself, can help you to avoid ever feeling that way again, that feeling of resentment towards yourself or the situation that you're like, I didn't even have a chance to think about that, and I don't like the way that, you know, that went about. Our spiritual choices then tend to determine which direction we choose when the moment arises. So if it wasn't for the silence, remember, the sound of God is silence. And I still love the guy that commented, let me give you a little help here. The sound of God is not silence. And I mean, fine, if you like waterfalls and birds and crickets and the wind through the leaves, then that is just fine. I'm not 
debating that that couldn't be the sound of silence. <laughs> I mean, he didn't go that far. He just said, let me give you some help. The sound of God is not silence. However, if we, I mean, if we can begin to determine through choice the spiritual direction that we want to go in when the moment, each moment arises, moment to moment, our life is made up of moments, ladies and gentlemen, and these moments end up being our experience. So if we want to have a higher quality of life experience, we need to increase our awareness and understanding of the nature of life and ourselves. So that through that awareness, we can have a higher quality of experience. Now, and then we can choose when each of these moments arises. It wasn't If it wasn't for the silence of consciousness, we would not be able to know what we are thinking. In other words, it would just be a constant bombardment. This is why when people wake up at two in the morning, they can't get back to sleep because their mind is just racing and racing. And they can't get to that silence of the consciousness to actually know what it is that we are thinking. And I mean, for some of us that have been in this constant, they call it the monkey mind, or I like to think of it as a train going by with a bunch of cars. It's like, and we're trying to focus on all the cars rather than being unattached and saying, huh, that was a weird thought. And, and I wonder what that was all about. You know, not a big deal. Having that silence of the consciousness to know what it is you're thinking about. Dr. David Hawkins continues, it's because of the silence of the forest that you can hear the sound of the leaves. It's because the mind is silent that you can hear or see the picture of what you are thinking. Therefore, the content of the mind must be going on in the space of no mind. Remember, it is the silence in between the notes, the space in between the notes that makes the music. It's the space in between the bars that holds the tiger. Ladies and gentlemen, not the bars, but the space. And so if we want to begin to be able to see this space, this area of no mind, I had no, I never know where this is going to go. This is always so deep and so profound, and I love each and every bit of this. And if you're getting value, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here and joining me. And Dr. David R. Hawkins, and I know you're getting value because this is profound. Be sure to smash the like and share this with somebody who's like-minded. And once again, we're reading from the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins' classic teachings on spiritual truth and enlightenment for purposes of teaching and commentary and expanding the mind so that we can increase the quality of our lives and the lives of those around us. So let's get to the end of this because this has been a great one, ladies and gentlemen. This has been very deep and it's tough to touch on so many wonderful topics. It's because the mind is silent that you can hear or see the picture of what you're thinking. So therefore, the content of the mind must be going on in the space of no mind. This is also a way to describe how reality is functioning within this non-reality. That makes sense. Like duality in a non-duality. Yes, that makes sense there. The only way the duality can exist is within a non-duality. In other words, it is because of the silence. If it wasn't for the silence of consciousness, you wouldn't be able to know what you're thinking because of the silence of the forest, you can the forest, you can hear sound. So therefore, the content of the mind must be going on in the space of no mind. And I'm sure if you're here and a spiritual student and researcher, you've heard this term, no mind. And it's a very common term. I mean, he goes, which is a classical term, meaning thoughtless or formless consciousness upon which thoughts reflect themselves. So we withdraw our investment and preoccupation and identification with the content of thinking and begin to see that we are the space in which the thinking can occur so once again back to that train and the train car is going by and each car is like a thought that has an emotion attached and it's going to make us feel a certain way 
and that keeps us from falling back asleep, so to speak, like at night when we wake up and we're trying to go back to bed, but our minds are racing. It is because an identification with the consciousness itself lifts us out of the identification with the emotion or the thought. Like we are the witnesser of the thought. We are not the thought. And that can allow you to relax immediately. And then you begin to withdraw your investment and preoccupation and attachment or identification to those train cars flying by with the content of our thinking. And we can begin to see that we are the space, that we have the freedom to choose. The value then of meditation, as we can see, is far more important than any, you know, little pamphlet will tell us. The value of meditation then is that it focuses us so that we can withdraw our investment and attachment and identification with the content of thought to the space in which the thought is occurring. Now, I know this is very deep, but if you're even getting this slightly, then you're getting it totally, because this is something that will expand in your understanding as you contemplate on it over time. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't know this would come up today, but in the words of the Egyptian sage god Thoth, the Ibis god, he's, he reminds us the most important thing in the prophecies of Hermes. And he says, these words, remember these. If you haven't heard them yet, you probably have if you've been here on this channel. You probably have them memorized now, hopefully, if you've been here on this channel. Pure philosophy is a spiritual striving through constant contemplation, a constant, medita a constant meditation, a constant rumination, a constant ponderation, a constant contemplation, ladies and gentlemen, to attain true knowledge of what he calls atum, the one God what we can call reality and the nature of reality that we find ourselves in. So the secret lesson from the God of wisdom and knowledge is this constant contemplation that can take us into a greater dimension. Ladies and gentlemen, the value of meditation then is that it focuses us so that we can withdraw our investment and identification with the content of thought and be able to be in that space in which the thought is occurring and be the witness. And then we begin to see that there is a witness to the thinking. That there is an awareness to the witness. And there's a substrate that underlies all of it that is beyond time, beyond dimension. And that is independent of personal identification. It's like, okay... Uh, who are, you know, who, who are these thoughts coming from? A witness to the thinking. And then that there is awareness to the witness that is witnessing the thinking. And you're like, so which one am I? Am I the thinking? Am I the witness that's seeing the thinking or the awareness that I am being the witness? Am I that awareness watching me witnessing the thinking? These are all great thoughts to have. This is why constant contemplation will get you to great understanding. And then that there's a bunch that goes under that that you could you could literally create an endless list of like who was the who was the witness of the awareness that witnessed the thinking, and on and on and on. And so it, it's like beyond time, beyond dimension, and that it is independent of a some sort of personal identification. In other words, we are all this oneness, or we are all God, experiencing it through a subjective viewpoint. But the identification then with the consciousness itself lifts us out of the identification of our reality as either the body or the mind or the thoughts or the feelings. And this allows us to go to an entirely new dimension, ladies and gentlemen. And I could end it there, but that would be silly. We only have like half a page left. So let me let me finish this up, ladies and gentlemen. 
as we move into that greater dimension, then we confirm the spiritual reality which underlies our existence. People become involved in spiritual work on a practical level, and they want to know, how can I forgive my enemies? You know, or like, how can I forgive my enemies when I hate them so much after all that they've done to me? How can I feel hope when I'm really depressed? And how can I get rid of... I mean, that's a big one. I feel for you there. How can we get rid of hope when we're in the middle of depression? Sorry, how can we feel hope? And how can we remove a depression? How can we get rid of fear when we are afraid all the time? These are the reasons of a spiritual pursuit. It starts out on a very practical level, on these very kinds of questions for each and every one of us, ladies and gentlemen, the beginning to a spiritual journey. And other people will start out from different levels. We're all individual once again. They start out through inspiration. They will hear an inspirational speaker and get uplifted. And hopefully I have been that individual for at least one person in this reality. That's why I've been doing this channel, is I had that influence from someone else to myself, and I've seen that that influence is the most important thing in my entire life and the lives of many others. And so usually it starts out for one of us through inspiration from somebody's wisdom, the wisdom of the ages. One can start from curiosity and one can start from sort of a spontaneous evolution with one, within one's own consciousness. I think spiritually evolved people inspire others outside of their awareness because they've influenced the field. People who have ordinarily not been interested in spirituality suddenly become curious. Not through any inner prompting but as a consequence of the field. And I think this increases more and more as we go through the cycles of the ages and increase in consciousness level naturally, universally, rather than, um, you know, interconnectively, collectively as a species. So if you are around people who are more spiritually evolved, you may find your own interest in it spontaneously becoming more intense. It's not through any deliberate decision-making, but just because it's more interesting to you all of a sudden. Like how when you were around people who were into sports and you tended to listen more and be interested in sports. And so when people have some kind of disaster in their life, and we hear about it all the time, you know, about an illness or drugs or alcohol or criminality or even grief and loss, they all want to know what they can do about it. The willingness to surrender life to the universe, to the force, to the harmony, to the power, not the force. When I said the force, I was thinking about like the force from Star Wars. But in today's lesson, the power rather than the force. And, you know, God, when we can sur surrender life to God, the universe, of course, is one of the most profound spiritual tools. People ask, what spiritual tools are the most powerful? I would say, David Hawkins says, humility and the willingness to surrender life, to let go of wanting to force and control it and push it. But rather, to let go of wanting to change it, even, and believing that it should be a different way. The willingness to surrender, how you see things to some higher spiritual principle. If God is not a reality for you, that's perfectly fine. You know, it's just a word to most people. That's why I like to, when I say God, and this is actually the words of Dr. David Hawkins here. He says, the willingness to surrender how you see things to God, and then in parentheses, or to some higher spiritual principle, because God is not a reality. It is just a word to most people. So this is why I use so many words like Atum and the universe and the Tao and grand organized design, great spirit, the you know, whatever it be, this great energy force that we are all a part of and connected to. 
David Hawkins continues, for most people, God is a hoped for reality, but not an experiential reality. That's powerful. Because I experience reality as being God. Like everything I look at and see, the screen in front of me and the camera and the reflection of myself and, you know, the reflections of light going on from cars going by and whatnot. This is all God. And our, its experience of itself and our uh, opportunity to be a part of that. But... It's like for most people, God is a hope for reality, but not an experiential reality like I was just describing until they become more spiritually advanced and begin to experience the presence of the force, of the power, of the field itself. And into it, it's enormous power. Then people, once they see that all of reality is God, even the plants and the trees and the leaves and the tables and chairs, everything. Then they begin to revere, quote-unquote, God. Because they respect that infinite power that they begin to notice, to realize, to experience and see, as he puts it, begin to intuit. What we can do on a practical level, then, is become the person we can become. I'd say become kind towards all of life. Be kind to one another, ladies and gentlemen. More importantly, be kind to yourself so that you can then be kind to another. What we can do on a practical level is become the best person we possibly can. Be kind towards all of reality and all of its expressions no matter what. That includes oneself, to be willing to forgive oneself and see the limitation of our own human consciousness that we have discovered in last week's reading of this about not being able to discern the difference between truth and falsehood because of our you know, limited um, perspective, our subjective perspective, based on the programming of our mind and the subconscious nature of the ego and all of the other things that we have gone through today, looking at power and force. And then talking about God and the force, as I like to describe it. But that makes it confusing, considering we talked about power versus force today power being harmony which empowers and force being a disharmony which exhausts and exhausts itself he finishes here saying i always feel dr david hawkins quote says i always feel that the more educated we are about the quality of consciousness the nature of consciousness the easier it is to follow spiritual principles. And if we understand that human consciousness is intrinsically innocent and cannot control that which it is programmed by, because it can't tell the truth from falsehood, then we begin to feel a sort of compassion and a love and a empathy but as the way he puts it there, quote, you begin to feel compassion automatically. Automatically, ladies and gentlemen. And we begin to increase and influence the consciousness level of humanity and mankind automatically without actually having to do anything at all, ladies and gentlemen. And that concludes chapter three spiritual consciousness and the last section of chapter three which was increasing the consciousness level lifting the consciousness level of mankind and that ladies and gentlemen is a boom to the wisdom 
of Dr. David R. Hawkins and classical teachings on spiritual truth and enlightenment. And so that was powerful, ladies and gentlemen. We have discovered several ideas for relinquishing the quest for perfection, following evolved spiritual values rather than dogmatic doctrines, and being grateful, introspective, and compassionate, not only towards ourselves, but towards others. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a boom to knowledge and a boom to wisdom. And I want to thank you so much. That was profound. I love and appreciate each and every one of you that spends time here with me. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, to seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through a greater awareness and understanding of the nature of reality that we find ourselves in. And remember to seek to discover the mysteries of our history. We will be diving into this in the future. I am looking forward to that. Ladies and gentlemen, the mysteries of our history and the secrets of the ages. And until next time, remember, there is no way to happiness because happiness is the way. It's what we must bring to life. And when we can do that, everything we've been telling ourselves, oh, when I get this or when I get that, then I'll be happy. That becomes irrelevant because then we already are there. And then the entire journey is wonderful. We also be sure to expand the description, check out our landscape paintings as well as to get the book for yourself, to put it on your shelf, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, I love and appreciate each and every one of you. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow on Wednesday Wisdom, diving deeper into the wisdom of the Corpus Hermeticum and Hermes Trismegistus. All right, love you, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time, be the change you want to see, be the example you want to set. Na -na 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 -na.